Shalom everyone, hope everyone's doing well. As with Hashem today, we will be starting the second parak in Mesechet Sanhedrin. The Mishnah here will begin as a new parak, new Mishnah, new topic really, which is going to have two sections in today's learning. The first section will discuss the unique halachot that apply to a Kohen Gadol and a king over other people. And then the Gemara will, in the second section, talk about the first idea of a Kohen Gadol being a judge as well as being judged as what the Chidush in that is. So at Hashem, our learning today, as always, should be for a Fua Shlema, for a speedy, quick, and full recovery for Yaakov ben Dina. And we should only hear Besorot Tovot. Let's look on Yedchet Amur Aleph, which is the second Perek, the, towards the top of the page, Kohen Gadol. So the Mishnah begins telling us the... Halachot that relate, we'll see, perhaps uniquely, in many ways he's the same as regular people, but in many ways he has unique halachot as well. Now the, the theme we're going to really see in this Mishnah is the idea that Kohen Gadol and the king, because of their prestige and their position, they were not allowed to engage in certain behaviors that the Hamon Am were allowed to. We'll see that uh, in general though, there are similarities as well. V'zat Hashem, we'll see this in the Mishnah. It says, the Mishnah, Kohen Gadol Dan Vidanin Oto. The Kohen Gadol, he can be a judge and he can also be judged by others. So that means that he can sit on a court to adjudicate others, as well as Danin Oto, a court can judge him as the litigant in a case. Meiru Meidin Oto. Also, he can testify, he could be a witness in court. And he, in, ad in addition, can be testified about, meaning if he's a litigant, witnesses can testify about him. He can perform chalitza, which means if a Kohen Gadol has a brother who passes away without children, now his, his deceased brother's wife needs chalitza, he can perform chalitza to send his deceased brother's wife away. Also, when this Kohen Gadol passes away without children, his brother, the Kohen, can do chalitza to send away his wife. Umiyabminet ishto, also, if this Kohen Gadol passes away, he can, his wife is shayach, is able to have yibum done by one of the deceased Kohen Gadol's brothers. Now, let's point out over here. That means if he has a brother as Kohen Hedyot, the Kohen Hedyot can marry the deceased Kohen Gadol's wife, and why is that? Because she's an almana, and a Kohen is allowed to marry an almana. However, the reverse is not true. However, a Kohen Gadol cannot do yibum. That means if the Kohen Gadol's brother's what brother passes away, he can't do yibum to marry his deceased Kohen brother's brother who was a Kohen's wife, because that woman is not a bitula. She's not an unmarried virgin girl, and a Kohen Gadol has to marry an unmarried virgin girl. So therefore he cannot do Yibum Mipnei Shehu Asor Balmana because he's prohibited in a widowed woman. A Kohen, a regular Kohen, is only prohibited in a Grusha, a divorced woman, in terms of the Grusha or Almana. But a regular Kohen could marry a widowed woman. But regarding a Kohen Gadol, he's held to a much higher standard. He is not allowed to do Yibum because that would mean he's marrying an almana, a widowed woman, and that's prohibited. Met lo met. Now, if the Kohen Gadol's immediate relative passes away, now generally the rule is, if it's a regular Kohen whose relative passes away, even though he's not allowed to become Tamemet, if it's a regular, uh, one, of, one of the immediate relatives of the Kohen, meaning if it's his father, mother, brother, sister, etc., he could become Tame by dealing with the body and the burial process as well. However, Kohen Gadol is held to a higher standard, and we'll see it's based on a Pasuk, because the Pasuk says, Umina Mikdash lo yetze. He cannot go out of the Mikdash. That's a Machlok, it's exactly how far does that go? So the, the Mishnah says, Met lo met, if the relative of the Kohen Gadol passes away, Eno yotze achar amita. He's not allowed to follow after the coffin. Rashi explains, if he follows after the coffin in the normative way, we're worried that he might accidentally touch the coffin, becoming Tameh, which he's not allowed to do, and therefore he's not even allowed to follow after, as Rashi explains, Yitrachek min He should separate from those things that are uh, despicable, meaning re refrain from even which is prohibited in a distanced sort of way. So in case he might touch it, he shouldn't even follow after the coffin in the normative way. 
but there is a certain way he could follow after the coffin at a distance. What happens is if the procession to bury this relative in the cemetery, if it enters, as Rashi explains, to an alleyway, if it's covered, he has to be revealed. When they are revealed, he should be Uncover, he should be covered. Now what that means, as Rashi explains, is if they're walking through from one alley to another, so if the procession goes into alley number two, he's allowed then to enter alley number one. He shouldn't be seen in the same line of vision with the coffin. This is a distance that was created so that he doesn't accidentally touch the coffin and become Tameh. But he could follow at that distance, that would be acceptable. Rameir says, and he could go with them until the entrance of the gate of the city, but not beyond that. This is the position of Rameir, because beyond that it's open space and he'd be together in vision, in line of vision with the coffin, that would be prohibited. However, Rameir says he is allowed to go out and follow the procession in this distanced way, because the way we understand the Pasuk that we're about to quote, Umina Mikdash Lo Yetze, it means he shouldn't, not that he shouldn't leave the temple literally, but means he shouldn't leave his status of Kadosh, of being holy. And therefore, by creating this distance, we know he won't, and that would be permissible. But Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, no, we learn the Pasuk Kipshuto. He's not allowed to leave the Beit HaMikdash. Means he can't follow at all. Literally, he can't leave the Beit HaMikdash even when his relative passes away. He's held to this very high standard. Because it says, He shouldn't leave the Mikdash. So therefore, he actually doesn't follow in this way that Rameir allows. Rabbi disagrees and doesn't allow that. Continues the Mishnah. Now, if a non-relative passes away, so it used to be there was the concept of the shurot. What was the shurot is when the mourners were walking back after the funeral, the mourners would stand still in a line. You can imagine a line. And next to them, the comforters, the menachamim, the comforters, the other people would walk by the mourners and would comfort them. So we're going to see when the Kohen Gadol wanted to be part of the comforters for a non-relative who had passed away, he was allowed to walk along next to the mourners, but he had to have a specific location based on his kavod. So let me just explain it outside and then we'll see it inside. So usually you had the mourners in one line and then the menachamim, the people who are comforting, walking next to them, uh, uh, parallel to them uh, and, and comforting them. The Kohen Gadol couldn't walk in that regular line of the comforters because that's not befitting of his kavod, of his position. So what they would do is they would set up the system as follows. You have the mourners, you have the comforters. Comforters doesn't mean a blanket. It means the people providing comfort, the other people. And then next to them would be the Kohen Gadol. And then beyond the Kohen Gadol would be the uh, his attendant, who was called the Skan Kohen Gadol, the attendant, the deputy Kohen Gadol. So the Skan would sandwich the Kohen Gadol between himself and the other comforters. And the Kohen Gadol would walk along, but not in the regular line, in order to comfort whoever the mourners were. Let's read that inside now. The Gemara says like this, the Mishnah says, okay, if he comforts others, so the regular line of comforters walk one after the other. The attendant of the Kohen Gadol would arrange him, the Kohen Gadol, between him, the attendant, on the outside, and then the people on the inside, and the Kohen Gadol would walk in between them, and he would comfort others. Now, if the Kohen Gadol had a relative pass away, so he was receiving comforting because others were coming to provide him with nechama, so the whole nation would say to him, I will be your atonement. So this is an interesting terminology, which means to say that if something bad happens, like a relative passes away, so to some degree, we look at this as some sort of a gzardin against the family. Kitruk, some sort of a negative force against the family. So the appropriate thing that people used to say was, is that we should act, we should accept some of that atonement so you shouldn't receive more negativity. So the people, when they would come to the Kohen Gadol, they would say, Anu kaparatcha, we will be your atonement. And he would say back to them, Titbarchu min ashamayim, you should be blessed from heaven, you shouldn't receive any negative outcome. Okay, now after the funeral, they would serve the first meal to the mourners, from other people. We have a, a sort of a re remnant of this minhag, which is we send food to the house of the mourners for the mourners to enjoy. The idea was is that they should eat food from other people. So, it's called Sudat Havra'ah. So, when they would 
uh, provide him with this food, when they would provide him with food if he was a mourner, the entire nation would sit on the ground, and he would recline on a bench, meaning is that it was done in a way to create a separation because of his dignity, he would sit on the bench recline, the nation would sit around him on the ground in providing him this this meal, the first meal given from others uh, at the time of a mourner uh, after the funeral. This is all regarding the Kohen Gadol. Now, regarding the king, we're going to see the king was held to an even higher standard. So whereas, for example, the Kohen Gadol was allowed to be a judge, allowed to be judged, we're going to see many of these things were not allowed for a king. Hamelech lodan velodanin oto. The king is not allowed to judge, nor is he allowed to be judged. Lo meid velo meidin oto. It's important to note over here something interesting is we do find for example, David, Shlomo, they did seem to hold court where they judged people in, in Nevi'im. It does come up. So we have to figure this out, but it would appear that the distinction is he's not allowed to sit as a regular judge amongst a Beit Din. But there were certain duties or allowances the king could essentially paskin based on his own decisions, and that was allowed. But he's not allowed to be part of a uh, classical sense to be a judge. That's not allowed for a king, nor is he allowed to be judged. Nor could he be a witness or to be witnessed against if he's the litigant. Which, anyway, is not allowed to be, so we'll see. Now, he cannot do chalitza, which is if his brother's wife passes, if his brother passes away, he cannot do the process of chalitza to send away his brother's wife. And the reason is because in that process, his deceased brother's wife would spit, and that would be disrespectful in front of the king. Nor could his wife receive chalitza. And this is very interesting. The king, after he passes away, his wife is not allowed to remarry anybody. So therefore, you can't have his brother do chalitza with his wife, because anyways, she can't remarry. Lo mi'abeim, the king does not do yibum, meaning if his brother dies, he doesn't marry her wife, his, uh, he doesn't marry his wife. Velo mi'abeim li'ishto, nor... If the king passes away, is his wife allowed to receive yibum? Similar as I said before, because once she's married to the king, she's not allowed to be married to anyone else after, including his brother. Rabbi Yudah says, if the king wanted to do chalitza or yibum, he's remembered for good. Meaning, he has the ability to decide, I will do chalitza or yibum, sort of being mochel in his kavod, it's something that's not as respectful for him. If he wants to, he'll be remembered for good, because that is a humble thing to do. No, we don't listen to him. It means if he says that we cannot listen to him, we'll see in the Gemara exactly what this discussion is all about. And also, if the king passes away, similar to how Yibam can't be performed to his wife, also his almana cannot get married. Because again, the woman who is married to a king can never remarry. A king could marry the widow of another king. It means if the king passed away, Another king who seizes power, has power after, could marry the widow. That wouldn't be disrespectful. We find by David Amelech, that after Shaul Amelech, the first of the Jewish kings, passed away, David married Shaul's widow. He had many queens. So he married one of the widows, like it says in Shmuel Bet, it says, I will place for you the house of your master. Hashem tells David, he tells him, you will, re- you will marry the wives of your master in your bosom, in your embrace, meaning to say is, that would be permissible since now you're a king, you're allowed to marry the widows of Shaul, the, the previous king. We'll see in the Gemara exactly the Pshatim and all of these Shitot. Okay, let's move on now. The Gemara, moving down to the second section now, focuses on the beginning of the Mishnah. We said in the beginning of the Mishnah, Kohen Gadol is allowed to judge, and he can be judged. So the Gemara wants to know exactly what's the chedush in this. Says the Gemara, Kohen Gadol Dan Pshita. The fact that he could judge, it doesn't seem to be an inherent chedush in that, because yeah, he's like a regular Jew. Of course he can sit on a court. What's the chedush? So the Gemara answers, you're right. That's not a chedush. The chedush is the next statement, which is Danin Oto, it's Terichalei. We wanted to say that he could be judged. That's a chedush. So since we said that he could be judged, we also said that he could be a judge. But the Gemara says, Hanami Pshita. It's also obvious he could be judged. Why? Because Ihu 
if he wouldn't be judged, how could he be a judge? Because we know, as we're about to show, it would be impossible if not for the fact that he could be judged, otherwise he wouldn't be allowed to be a judge. The fact that you're saying he could judge, we already know he could be judged. How do we know this? Because Vachtiv, the Pasuk in Tzafania says, it says, search yourself and then search others. And this teaches us, First, you have to adorn yourself, which means if you have issues, you have to fix up yourself. And afterwards, you could fix up others. So as we're bringing it back here, that in the classical sense means if you have something wrong with you and you point it out in others, that's ridiculous. First, fix up your own problems and then start telling people what to do, which really means we don't have the ability very often to tell people what to do. But the point is, is that in our regard too, if you're telling me that the king could be judged, so once we know that he could be judged, so it's logical also that he could judge. Because again, that's that's the principle here, which is, if 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 not for the fact that Dainina lay that he could be judged, where others point out, a second. Sorry, hold on one second. Means the Gemara is saying it's obvious then. Once you know that he could judge, right, right, exactly. Once you know that he could judge others, if you're saying that first part of the Mishnah, so then the second part of the Mishnah, Vidanin Oto, that becomes obvious. Because if he could judge others, that's like judging them, searching in them. So then obviously others have the ability to judge him because we have the ideas, you first fix yourself up and then you go to fix somebody else up. So it must be if he could judge, of course he could be judged by others. So then that's not a Chidush either. So then what's the Chidush in the second part of the Mishnah? What's the Chidush in this whole statement? So Ella the Gemara gives two answers. First answer, the Gemara says, Since in the end of the Mishnah, we wanted to say a king cannot judge or be judged. So We also taught regarding the Kohen Gadol, sorry, Kohen Gadol Dan Vidanin, that he could judge and be judged. Meaning to say is, it just wanted to teach the contrast, keep it uh, universal, how the Mishnah flows. The Ibaitim, alternatively, second answer, Akamash Malan, that actually needs to say that he could be judged for a very particular halacha. Now the halacha is regarding Ir Miklat. If somebody kills a Jew, Bishogeg, unintentionally, so he has an obligation to run away to Ir Miklat. That is a city of refuge. And the Torah tells us that he has to stay there, when he kills Bishogeg unintentionally, until the Kohen Gadol passes away. So the Brayta says as follows, Kedetani, Kohen Gadol Sha'aragat HaNefesh. What if the Kohen Gadol himself kills somebody? So the, the Brayta says like this, B'meizid, if he kills intentionally, Ne'arag, so he's put to death. He killed intentionally. B'shogeg, but if it was unintentional, gole. So then he's sent to exile to the Ir Miklat. Ve'over alaseva lotase, he transgresses a positive and negative commandment. We'll discuss tomorrow what that refers to on Amud Bet. I... Sorry, that's another bright And he's like an ordinary person in every matter. So the Gemara says, Of course, if he kills intentionally, he's put to death. That's the normal rule. So the Gemara answers, The Chedush is, if he kills Bishogeg, we need to say there he goes into exile. So the Gemara says, Anami Pshita, that's also obvious. He's a normal person. So the Gemara says, No. It's derich. It's necessary to state that if he kills Bishogeg, he also goes to Galut, to the Ir Miklat. Why? Sal I mean, I would have thought to say, Oil Vechtiv, since it says in the Torah, Vyashav Ba Ad Mota Kohen Agadol, that he should live in the Ir Miklat until the death of the Kohen Gadol. That's the rule. The one who kills unintentionally stays in exile until the death of the Kohen Gadol. So Amai might say, Called it leta kanta bechazara that any person that there will be a solution eventually for him to return when the kohen gadol passes away legally. So the Torah is teaching us he should go into exile. But the let leta kanta bechazara somebody will never have this solution lo legally. Maybe the Torah is teaching us he doesn't go into exile. It's none like the Mishnah teaches us in Makot. Sorry, one second, Chevra. Sorry. The Mishnah in Makot tells us that Ha-horeg Kohen Gadol or Kohen Gadol She'arag nefesh If someone kills a Kohen Gadol or a Kohen Gadol that kills a person. Now in either of these scenarios, 
If it's Bishogeg, if someone murdered the Kohen Gadol, so when he goes to Galut, he can't rely on the death of the Kohen Gadol because there was no Kohen Gadol when he went into exile. So he'll be stuck in exile forever. Similarly, if a Kohen Gadol kills somebody, says the Mishnah in Makot, turning to Yilchet Murbet, he's also never going to be able to get out because he is the Kohen Gadol. So only when he dies, he'll leave, meaning he'll die in his coffin. He'll die and be buried in his coffin. That's how he'll leave. So the Mishnah says, I know Misham la'olam. So you might say, since he can never leave, he doesn't fit the bill of Galut, so you might say maybe he doesn't go to exile in the first place. He doesn't even go to Ir Miklat. Kamash Malan, that's the Chidush, which is to say that nonetheless, that Brayta teaches us if he kills Bishogeg, he still goes into exile and he remains there forever. So says the Gemara, that's the Chidush of our Mishnah. Tanin Oto, what is it specifically referring to? It's referring to where he killed somebody Bishogeg. You might say, he, we're not Tanin Oto, we don't judge him, we don't send him to exile. Mash Malan, we do send him to exile. Says the Gemara, ve'emachinami. But that seems like a very good logic. Maybe he shouldn't go into exile. So the Gemara answers, Amar Kra. No, there's a pasuk that answers that. It says, Lanus Shama Kol Rotzech. It says, all murderers have to run there. So that teaches us that even if a person is a Kohen Gadol who will never be able to leave, he'll also be judged to go into exile. I feel a Kohen Gadol b'mashma, even referring to the Kohen Gadol, that if he kills Bishogeg, he'll have to be sent into the Ir Miklat, even though he'll never be taken out. And that's the second shot in the Chidush of the Mishnah, Dan Vidaninoto. We're stopping at the top of Yerchet and Mudbet. Bezrat Hashem will pick up tomorrow the top of Yerchet and Mudbet. We'll learn Yerchet and Mudbet. In the meantime, everybody have a wonderful day.